Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions on uh, the last presentation. Uh, first of all, you made a point that uh, uh, private ownership, uh, the outcome of private ownership could be inferior to that of community-owned management. And I think uh, this is quite uh, untrue uh, because if you grant access to a private company or a private individual to own the fishery, they will balance the marginal cost of extraction uh, with the marginal benefit, and the extraction path will be optimal. Unless, of course, we talk about some extra externalities that are not internalized by the private individual, uh, which the community will account for. If that is the case, that could be true. Uh, perhaps uh, if also there are, uh, uh, okay, first we have externality, and then the cost of securing uh, maybe the fishery. If, for example, a private individual owns the fishery, and that private individual has to incur some extra costs to protect the fishery, which is not a case for the community, then we can also say that that of the community could be a better way to manage the fishery than the private individual. But if all these conditions are not there, then it is always the case that if you grant access to a social planner or an individual who, to manage or a private entity to manage the fishery, the outcome will be uh, much better or be uh, uh, superior to uh, if you grant access to a community. Uh, the second uh, issue I have is about the use of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the dependent variable you use, which is consumption of fresh uh, fish. Uh, so this is not quite surprising because if, if initially uh, the resource is managed as a, an open access, let's say unregulated open access, and then now you restrict access by granting commu the communities uh, some right uh, to uh, exclude people or to limit the extraction of the resource, it's, it's always the case that harvest levels uh, or harvest per boat or, or per trip will be higher. And for that matter, we will see consumption uh, per member of uh, the household increasing. So what is surprising about the results? Okay, so I, you, know, you have two questions, so let me take both of them one at a time. First of all, from a theoretical perspective, there's no reason uh, to assume that, uh, that the community work at operating as a unit will not e realize the same efficiency gains as a private individual in terms of internalizing all costs and benefits, right? So you, you said that uh, a private, private ownership will always be more efficient, and actually that's the core of what's interesting here, is that if you grant a community rights, strong property rights over their resource, they are also able to put in place resource use rules that then lead to optimal resource use and investment over the long term and the internalization of those costs and benefits. So it, we're not talking, that's why I was really clear in the beginning, that we're not talking about open access, right? We're talking about collective ownership rights, in which case the community is actually able, if they have effective uh, internal governance mechanisms, to realize the same efficiency gains as a private individual would be and, and over the same kind of time horizon. So that's actually a theoretical question that's important to understand the study here. Um, the second question regarding uh, the outcome, whether or not we would see uh, improvements and should we be surprised to see improvements in fresh fish consumption, well, we are only going to see uh, improvements in fresh, fresh fish consumption if indeed these they are able, with the, with the support of the state, to do exactly what you said, which is effective, more effectively exclude outsiders and realize those, those benefits of the fishery internally. Um, so theoretically, they, there's nothing surprising. But we have had, never had any empirical evidence that it actually happens, right? That, there's lots of theory, but we've never seen whether or not that's true. So um, I don't think the results are surprising. I think they are what we would expect, but I think it's, it's obviously quite important to make sure that what you expect is indeed what's, what's happening. You want to go the welfare question? That was the, that was the welfare question, yeah. Great. OK. Amen. I'd like to ask, uh, I'm quite familiar with the literature on I like and many I, institutional learning and change. And mm. many institutions, like for example, the CGIAR has tried to, very hard to internalize the theory of so-called ILAC, call it OLAC, in your case, organizational learning and change. 
And they are sort of well-established analytical categories. How does an organization or institution learn? And then how does such an institution change is internalizing the lessons from the learning, right? Well, and the examples you give would fit relatively well into this literature. But the words, the terminology, the discourse is not the same. Mm. And I'm wondering, and maybe that rejoins the question that was asked before here, is this a parallel effort? Is that the subsequent effort? How do you relate what you are proposing here to this kind of body of thought about institutional learning and change? And if it would be helpful, at least to me, if you could place your effort relative to what we already find in the literature. Um, well, I, again, I, I hope it's a parallel effort because I'm right and you're right, so we must be moving in parallel directions. Um, I think, I mean, coming back to this first very hard question, um, so uh, we, we, we may be right and moving in parallel directions, but in fact you have yet to have a lot of impact on a lot of mainstream development organizations. CJAR, let's bracket for a second. But like, if you look at what has just happened at the World Bank, it's the paradigm opposite of what we're saying. They have just undertaken a major organizational reform to do exactly the opposite of this, right? So, so I, I, now, that's just maybe even stronger agreeing with you that even though you know, your report from seven years ago and other things have identified the potentiality of this, it's uh, it has yet to make a dent in the conventional paradigm. That said, um, I think uh, a lot of the work on innovation has focused rightly on technological innovations that are at least an, uh, technological innovations. And a lot of technological innovations are in fact capable of logistical scaling, right? So the kind of organization I would build, uh, so you know, we've seen lots of innovation in the world, um, you know, Facebook and Google and all of this, and a lot of it has the nature that there really is a core technical problem that once better solved, essentially self-scales. Now, again, I would be stupid to say anything about the CGIAR and agriculture with you guys sitting there. <laughs> but my vague impression was, you know, the first generation of efforts thought that the problem was exclusively technologically. If we had a better seed, people will build a path to it. And then realized that, no, it's not just a technical problem. There's at least some ways in which we have to have adequate positive models of the scalar of farmer practices and then people built around how do we combine our technological improvements with scaled farmer practices. And there I think that's where you've had much more mixed success even in the agricultural domain, meaning there's been more technological progress in some domains than has been capable of having particularly governmental organizations carry that out into practice. Is that, uh, is that, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Using kind of new language reminds me of French sociology, where we right. have wave after wave. No, no. Uh, what, what, <laughs> one of one of the things we have in some of the papers we've written is like a concordance, right? So I think one of one of the small ways in which I think what we're trying to do has value added is pointing out that this is a coherent approach and you, these elements have to fit together. And then, like I say, we have a concordance of like, here is what, you know, for each step in terms of, you know, identification of problems, in terms of how learning scales, we then often say, here are the nine other people and how they talk about it. So it's like, it's not like we're ignorant of Ostrom and, and the other efforts that have gone before. It's just, we're trying to build a coherent story that goes from start to finish, whereas I think lots of the other efforts have sliced off one or more of the elements, and there are some that have gone top to bottom, but we're, we're you know, to some extent, you know, uh, 
lots of parallel efforts pushing in similar ways will be helpful as long as we all recognize that we're not competing over whether it's this word versus that word. It's like, here's a conceptual approach and we're trying to, we're trying to get that. But I think one of the reasons why it's been less successful is there has to be a certain coherence to the overall approach. You know, if you just say to, you know, if you go to somebody in the World Bank and say, oh, by the way, here's a log frame, and this log frame allows you to introduce multiple possibilities into your project, but everything else about the way the organization treats the project demands uniformity, there's incoherence between the reform element um, and what needs to change. So one of the things about overall changes is that they've got to be coherent, right? You've got to pull the organization in a coherent direction. Why don't we take... Yeah, I was going to say, in the interest of time, I'm going to get three of you to ask questions. The rules are they have to be short. They have to be one question, not two half questions. And uh, we'll start with you, sir. Yes. Yep. Uh, okay, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I'm uh, Nguyen Meng Hai from uh, CIM. And uh, my question goes to Tara. Uh, just one question. Uh, to save time. And um, you, you talk about the, there are two uh, communities, I can say, or, or ethnic groups there, Indian Fijian and also the ethnic uh, Fijian. And, and just uh, the only the ethnic uh, Fijian can uh, have the uh, collective ownership rights on the uh, fishing area, uh, in some uh, small fishing area. So my question is, uh, is there any protest or fighting of Indian Fijian over the uh, uh, the ownership of the uh, fishing areas? Because the fishing areas, uh, from my understanding, is we can consider as the natural resources of the state of the nation. So, what do you think about that? Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Rachel. Rachel? Hi, I'm Rachel Giselquist from UNU Wider. So I um, thank you both for really interesting presentations. I guess one thing that continues to puzzle me with the PDIA project, or at least I think it's a it's an issue that I that I keep coming back to, is what what exactly is the um, how exactly do we think about locally identified problems? Because obviously there are multiple local groups with competing interests, and I think Tara's study. Um, underscores this especially well, you know, the different interests between right. ethnic Fijians and Indo-Fijians. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about that a bit more, Lent, and maybe Tara has insights as well. Yeah, great question. Good. One more? Hello? Yep, on the front here. Thank you very much. <coughs> Francie Lund from the University of Kozulu Natal. Um, I quite agree with some of your critique of what you were saying. I think the one particular thing I want to, to pick out is that I think in trying to go forward, in one respect you go backwards for me in terms of my understanding of sort of organization development. And that was where you talk about organizational capability. And I think a lot of the breakthroughs of the last 15 years, part of which have come to, to in, in contestation of this logical framework stuff, is, is to say there isn't an organization that out there that is separate from people. I can't say I, that, that my organization should do this. It's I am my organization, and what am I going to do? So it is that sense of personal agency, which I think has really been important. And I was surprised, given your overall intent, to see you talk again about organizational capability. You talked about inducing agents to do things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was, it was a surprising phrase for me to see in the whole context of, your, of what I think I understand your overall intent is. And I'm, I just wanted to put that on the table. Hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to let Tara respond first, and she's got one, and then we'll let uh, Lant have the last two. Okay, great. So first of all, yes, this is clearly a political issue. I, I, am I echoing? Yes, I, have a, I think I have a lot going on here. Yeah, you've still got yeah. two going on. Please. Okay. Okay, better? Perfect. Um, so, I mean, like I said, there was a coup. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a coup because uh, there was an attempt to move from 
uh, collective ownership rights that were recognized to a much stronger uh, framework in which the resources were entirely given to the community to the community groups. Um, so yes, there's a coup. However, first of all, the ethnic Fijians are significantly more powerful uh, than the Indo-Fijians. And second of all, the, for the structure of the economy, the Indo-Fijians don't really rely on the, uh, the fisheries in the same way that the ethnic Fijians do. So the ethnic Fijians, most of them are subsistence. The Indo-Fijians never had resources in the first place because they came over, they were brought to work the sugar plantations by the British in the 1800s. So they were always in the cities. Um, to the extent that they use the fisheries, it's sort of very margin, it's much more the, the, the lowest caste. I mean, they use them, but the, lo the, the poorest of the poor, uh, Indo-Fijians with the least political power, uh, use the fisheries. Uh, for subsistence fishing because they don't have jobs. So the Indo-Fijians with power don't care as much about the fisheries because they're in the cities working in manufacturing. But yes, it's still, I mean, clearly there's a conflict. Um, and that's actually why strengthening the, the intervention to strengthen police support for the community's efforts to police their own waters is was, was such an significant intervention because what had before been essentially a battle between community groups saying get off our fishery and Indo-Fijians, the poor ones who just came along and fished, uh, now the police weighed in and actually the community could arrest Indo-Fijians and hand them off to the police. Yeah. So I, I think question of problem construction is precisely about there are multiple problems out there facing multiple competing stakeholders and framing problem you know framing problems in certain ways is going to be conducive to generating an authorizing environment in which you can make change versus others and this is better I think served by example so you know one of the examples we use is um, you know, many bureaucracies have a process compliance mentality as their definite as their problem definition, versus a performance mentality, which puts them in conflict rather than cooperation. So in Brazil, there was a labor agency responsible for enforcing, you know, labor safety law, and their modality was they would visit a plant, they would inspect the plant, and they would write up the plants that were in violation of the law, and that kind of neither really had any impact on firm behavior because A, they would hide, B, they would bribe. So there was an effort within the organization to say, we're gonna visit the plants and focus on workplace safety. So rather than focus on compliance with the workforce regulation, we're gonna look at output data on number of uh, agents issued and we're gonna take it as our goal as the organization to help the firm avoid accidents independently of whether this pushed them into compliance. So again, you've just changed the problem formulation. I mean, another example is, you know, in South Africa, there's all kinds of problems with crime, all kinds of problems with police corruption, all kinds of problems with violence. But, you know, at one point, there was a coalition of forces around how women got treated after rape. Because women, even after having been raped, if they reported to the police, often got you know, further abuse, if not, you know, from disrespectful to abusive treatment by the police. So again, that was a problem where you could slice off, you know, you weren't attacking police corruption, which is a necessarily conflictual view between the population, the politicians, and maybe the bureaucracy. We sliced off something where the politicians could support it, the bureaucracy could say this is the kind of problem that, it, you know, reformers within the bureaucracy could say this is the kind of problem where I can motivate support from within the organization because it's not existential to our organization and you could, get a, you could get a coalition around that problem framed as problem. So again, I don't think there's anything magical about this and, and it's impossible to, you know, your question was how exactly would we do this? Jesus, I don't know. I mean, how exactly we would do it, I'm far from knowing. But it's easier to look at examples and say, here are some really good examples of problem formulation, and then here are really bad examples of formulation where, for instance, our colleague Matt Andrews, who works on public finance management, you know, went out to work with the Department of Justice in Mozambique that had spent, you know, I don't know, 
four years and $50 million of donor money to create some MIS system for tracking court cases. And basically, it was completely dysfunctional. And, you know, the employees of the court, like, all they really needed was a spreadsheet. But no one had ever, like, said, what do you need to know to really make this work better? And let's start from where you are and work to where you want to be. So, again, it's easy to come out with still, again, years and decades and decades in, egregious sort of examples in which the world is still operating on your lack of the solution is your problem. Your lack of my solution is your problem. And and better formulations of problems. Again, does that speak to your question, if not answer it? Okay. Um, on the last thing, I, I, I just disagree. So this would have to be a longer conversation. I mean, organizations ontologically are something, and they ontologically are something independent of the aggregation of the people in them. They just are something. And, and I think pretending that they're not something is a problem. Uh, I think it's the key thing thing. I think it's about even talking about locating and identifying problems and problems right. in the way that you're doing, I think quite rightly. Right. Then you've got to say it is the people. Of course I know ontologically they they are there. You right. you in you wider is there. Right. But you can't say that you in you wider will fix something or change. It's going Absolutely. to be the individual Absolutely. inside and, and, there. You know, in our in our framework we have sort of tiers of agents and how they're engaged. But the point is, is that, uh, you know, the, the, but, but you do come back to organizations are something and agents interact with that something um, such that you can't add up the individual capacities and get the organizational capability. So the, the aggregate of the knowledge of the doctors in the public sector in India isn't the aggregate of what they do in their organizational practices. And organizational practices inter interact with agents. That said, obviously the only active agents are agents. <laughs> um, and part of our whole theory is, is that you need to mobilize a sufficient, a sufficient, I mean part of our theory again is that the, re the way unsuccessful organizations survive is that the leadership of the organization kind of pursues isomorphic mimicry and frustrates and prevents the agents within the organization from forming more effective coalitions. And you need to break that down in order to re-break it up. So again, I'm not pretending that organizations are, in some sense, the driving agents without human beings involved. But on the other hand, the donors have this really nasty tendency to want to train individuals, right? And without asking, is the lack of training of individuals really the the, the, the constraint on a more effective organization, right? Uh, and so, you know, uh, training is often like the most sacrosanct and yet the most completely worthless part of donor activities. Um. On that note. <laughs> Thank you very much to, to Lance and to Tara. Thank you for giving up your afternoon when you could have been somewhere else to come and join us. Uh, thank you, and uh, enjoy a coffee break, and we'll resume, I guess, at uh, 3.30 for the next session. Thank you.